first reading first reading comes from uh, Luke chapter 22 verses 54 to 62. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance, and when there was some, they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to, with, to him before the ro rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The second reading is from Acts 2, verses 36 to 41. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accept his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Lovely to see you all. And do I tell you happy Father's Day? Is that, is that how we do this? I can, I'm never really sure on Father's Day and Mother's Day, but uh, uh, happy Father's Day, uh, Dad's out there. Uh, now, Penrith, uh, over the last few years, uh, we've spoken about the first fund Sunday of uh, September as Church Father's Day, as, as Barry has alluded to. Uh, and we've used this opportunity to do a bit of a deep dive into church history and, uh, and come up with a model for fathers in general, but, but uh, in particular, but all of us in general. Um, we've looked at the English reformer Hugh Latimer. We looked at uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, and similarly today, uh, we're going to look at the Apostle Simon Peter. Now, there's a usefulness to having models in our life, isn't there? People that we model our lives on. Uh, clearly, we seek to be transformed in the likeness of Jesus. Uh, but as we do that... Uh, perhaps more and more we recognise how far from Jesus we are, uh, both in, in deity and in godness and, and also in sinlessness. We recognise how far we are from him. Uh, and so it's helpful to have other models too. Uh, it's, it, this in itself is biblical. The Apostle Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so there's something really useful. There's something really uh, God-ordained about having good role models. Uh, and so it's good for us to spend some time with the Apostle Simon Peter. But having some spend, uh, spent time in Acts together over the last uh, couple of months now, um, uh, we, we've seen a very robust, very confident uh, picture of Simon Peter, haven't we? Um, publicly calling the, the Jewish leaders to repentance. We, we've seen him condemning Ananias and Sapphira uh, for lying to the church. Uh, we see him having visions and dream, uh, of, of dreams of weighty theological conundrums about what's clean and what's now unclean uh, for the people of God. And so as we look at Simon Peter in Acts, I imagine you might look at him and think, well, he's just so different from me. Uh, he's an apostle, I'm clearly not. 
Uh, he's a man of his time. I'm clearly nothing like him. Um, but today, I just want to show you three ways uh, that we are, or at least can, model ourselves on Simon Peter uh, for, for, for our good and for God's glory. Let me just tell you what they are, and then we'll, we'll head through them. Firstly, his active recognition and following of Jesus. Uh, secondly, Simon Peter, uh, we can see his response to failure. Uh, and thirdly, we can see his passion for repentance and faith in Jesus for those around him. So let me take each in turn. Firstly, notice Simon Peter's active recognition and following of Jesus. Now, uh, I'd love you to come back with me to uh, even before where Marianne read in, in Luke chapter 5, verse 1. That's where we'll begin, Luke chapter 5, verse 1. And I'd love you to have a look at it with me, just so you know that I'm not making it up. Uh, chapter 5, uh, verse 1. Uh, so here we meet a very ordinary man. Uh, uh, we meet uh, Simon, or, uh, uh, not yet Simon Peter. Um, it's a very earthly human picture of, of the apostle here. He's not like the Acts preacher we just heard from in uh, the second reading. Um, Peter was just a native of a Hicksville northern village. Hicksville isn't a real place, by the way, but it's just a, a northern village. Uh, he grew up uh, as a fisherman uh, in a really remote place, uh, a long way from the hustle and bustle of the capital, Jerusalem. Uh, and he fished alongside his brother, Andrew, his fishing partners. You'll see in verse 10 there, Simon and John, the sons of Zebedee. And right there you have four apostles in one fleet, four future apostles in one fleet. Now, when Jesus comes along a teaching, uh, uh, for them, everything changes. Um, Simon Peter recognises that he's in the presence of greatness, uh, both Jesus as a teacher and Jesus as as he obeys Jesus' fishing instructions and catches a, a completely unexpected net full of fish. Um, have a look at verse 8, chapter 5, verse 8. Uh, when Simon Peter saw this, uh, this massive net of fish, uh, when Pe Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. See, Simon Peter recognises his distance from Jesus. His sinfulness puts him at a distance from, from this, this one of greatness. Uh, now, Jesus doesn't obey Simon Peter's command, but instead gives him a command of his own. See the second part of verse 10 there? And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything and followed him. So despite Simon Peter's recognition of his sinfulness, he immediately obeys Jesus' call. For all his faults, for all his sinfulness, for all his recognition of the distance between him and Jesus, Simon Peter agrees to follow Jesus. Now, you'll notice that it wasn't just a statement of faith there. Uh, it's not just a tick box, yep, uh, yep, I'm following Jesus. No, it's actually literally he gets up, leaves his net, and follows Jesus. Uh, let's face it, Simon Peter would never have been an apostle if this ordinary man didn't make that decision then and there, right? That's where it all starts. Simon Peter could not have been a model to us if it wasn't just for that initial radical decision of obeying Jesus and literally following him. Let me just say something to, to, to fathers and, by extension, grandfathers and uncles uh, who are invested in kids' lives. Um, Elizabeth uh, recommended a book to me, uh, the, 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 recommended that the parents here uh, read a book, Ed Drew. It's, it's Raising Confident Kids in a Confusing World, A Parent's Guide to Grounding Identity in Christ. And, of course, I'm reading it because I do everything Elizabeth tells me to do. Um, and in it, the author makes the point that being a Christian parent starts with being a Christian. Uh, that is, not just saying Christian things, not just teaching Christian things, but actually being Christian, living as a Christian, uh, showing kids that you repent of your sins, 
Showing kids that in your prayers you trust God, even when things seem to be out of control. Now, I find that quite convicting. Uh, it's, it's such a simple point, but it, it, it's true, isn't it? The author speaks of, of the culture of your home. Let me read it to you. Uh, your children live and breathe your family culture. They notice what you usually say in a crisis. They notice what you, where you go, who do you go to with your problems. They notice what gets the best of your time, what gets cancelled. What makes you angry? What makes you leap off the sofa with joy? They know what must never be interrupted and what competes for your attention. What I find most convicting there is that question. Is Jesus in each of those moments in your family culture? You can look at Simon Peter's response to Jesus and see a recognition of the greatness of Jesus. That's actually lived out in his behaviour. You can see it in his response to Jesus. He pulled up the boat on the shore, left the nets, and followed him. And of course, nothing ever goes wrong for Simon Peter, does it? He lives a model Christian life. He has no struggles. He suffers no crisis of faith. He's a perfect model for us. No, of course things go wrong for him. We heard it in the very first passage, didn't we? Peter's failures are many and varied. And uh, that's why I wanted to move to this second point. Um, As we look at Simon Peter as a model, we actually see his response to failure. And that's worth modelling. Have a look with me. Uh, uh, So we've already seen Simon Peter's recognition of his own sinfulness back in chapter 5. But now we'll see it play out publicly in in that predicted way. Um, uh, it, it, It starts in Luke 22. Uh, So when the pressure is turned up, Simon Peter uh, denies his association, as we heard today, not once but three times. And this was predicted by Jesus in Luke 22. Let me set the scene for you of Luke 22 um, while you find it, Uh, Luke 22. Uh, And the disciples just enjoyed the Last Supper together and they missed Judas' ominous presence and then disappearance to betray Jesus Uh, The disciples have argued about, guess what, who's the greatest? Uh, And then this happens. Chapter 22, verse 31, you see it there? Jesus says this, um, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, Strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. And we've heard how that plays out in the first Bible reading. But what what I really want you to notice is this. Before Peter's bluster, before Peter's bravado, Jesus says these words to him. Even after predicting this crucial telling failure, this is what Jesus says to him. Verse 32, And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. What an encouragement that is in the words of Jesus. I'm not sure that you have failed in a way that Simon Peter has failed. I'm not sure that you've failed that publicly. I suspect you've felt the temptation to deny Jesus at times. Peter doesn't even know he's going to fail so publicly, but Jesus prepares him in this. What to do after he fails? Go, strengthen your brothers. After you've turned back, go, strengthen your brothers. It's lovely in that this just commends to us that in Jesus, you you don't just have one chance, you blow it, you're out, right? You mess up in a major way, go back, strengthen your brothers. You, you see that? It's just, it's beautiful the way that Jesus sets this up. Um, that's how being a Christian works. Uh, after you've failed, what does Jesus say? Go strengthen your brothers. Now, applying this in particular to fathers, um, if you, as I was, uh, a little bit 
convicted by that, uh, uh, the culture of your family, uh, if, if you've done things badly in your family, if you've uh, not acted in line with what you say that you believe about Jesus, if you've been prayerless or faithless or worldly, none of these things are irredeemable. Uh, so I'd say to you fathers, after you've failed, go strengthen your family. Well, that's what Jesus says to Peter, isn't it? Go strengthen brothers and sisters. Which is, of course, exactly what the Apostle Peter goes on to do. We've heard about it in the book of Acts over the last two, two months, haven't we? He goes on recognising the forgiveness that he's received in Jesus to feed his brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, that's what we see thirdly. Uh, so thirdly, model yourself on Peter's passion for repentance and forgiveness. Uh, 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 passion for repentance and faith in Jesus, in the lives of the people around him. Uh, Jesus stands in the first chapter of Acts and uh, commands the apostles to be witnesses to all that they'd seen, culminating in Jesus' death and resurrection. And this witness is the basis of the gospel, the news that had to be proclaimed. Uh, and this was the content of the gospel that was to be proclaimed in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Uh, now, as we've gone through Acts Sunday by Sunday, we've seen the Apostle Peter's proclamation of that message. He's been bold, courageous, dauntless in proclaiming that message, hasn't he? Um, Mary Ann read for us Acts chapter 2. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, you see the Spirit arrives in Jerusalem. The Apostle uh, Peter proclaims, uh, 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 proclaims Jesus and that Jesus claims to the Jewish people. And then we read this, Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 23. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. See, Simon Peter doesn't hold back here, does he? Uh, speaking to the Jewish audience, you put him to death. And you see the effect that his speech has. Uh, verse 36 there. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive this gift of the Holy Spirit, this promise is for you, for you and your children and for all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. So we see again this dauntless proclaiming of the gospel at the hands of the Apostle Peter. Uh, verse 40 goes on. Uh, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptised. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. So, so, so like uh, our Lord Jesus, at the heart of Peter's dauntless proclamation was a call for repentance and faith. Uh, no one could accuse uh, Simon Peter of tiptoeing around the issues here, tiptoeing around the claims of Jesus, tiptoeing around the, the need for a response of repentance. He was very bold in proclaiming those things. And the Apostle Peter, you'll see, continues to call for repentance and faith as he writes his letters to the churches in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. You see the same content there. I can imagine you might sit there and think, well, look, I'm actually never going to proclaim the gospel in Jerusalem. I'm probably never going to jump up in Penrith and proclaim the gospel there either. You might say, I'm not going to write a letter to churches calling on them to repent and trust in Jesus. That's just, I just can't see that, that, that happening. There's a little verse in Acts that I just want to remind you of, of the place where Simon and Peter started. Have a look at 4.13. Uh, when, they call, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So, okay, so if you're calling people to repentance and faith, can I ask you, how, how would that work for you? What would that look like for you to call people to repentance and faith? When someone 
When has someone called you to repentance? When has someone helped you see the sin in your life which has led to repentance? I suspect it's rarely like Acts 2 and 3. I suspect it's more like person to person. Um, I suspect it's more like someone asking the right question at the right time rather than making accusations at the wrong time. Uh, Questions like, is there anything in your life you need to say sorry sorry to God for? Uh, Other questions, are there any idols in your life uh, that, you need to say uh, that, 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 you, that you're hanging on to for significance that take the place of God. Is there something that you're looking for, uh, ultimate meaning, significance and satisfaction, that is not God? Is there anything that has become the primary focus of your hearts and your lives overshadowing your devotion to God? Questions like that. Do you ask those questions of yourself? Could you ask those questions of the people around you? Jesus calls people to repentance and faith. Simon Peter called people to repentance and faith. What about you? If you called someone to repentance and faith, who knows, that might be the most loving thing you've ever said to them. Well, as we've seen in the book of Acts, It's pretty rare for the gospel to be proclaimed without persecution following. Uh, Simon Peter calls for repentance and faith, even despite suffering. Uh, Now, we're told from early church sources, not from the Bible, that uh, Peter uh, perished at the hands of uh, Roman Emperor Nero in 67 AD. This is how his earthly life ended, Uh, perhaps even crucified uh, upside down as the story goes. And so so as we think about modelling our lives on someone, Simon Peter's life is not one that starts perfectly, travels smoothly, or or ends in a fulfilling way. But perhaps that makes this model all the more powerful for us. I've been listening to the autobiography of the uh, New Zealand actor Sam Neill most famous for his role in Jurassic Park as Dr. Alan Grant. Now, he spoke of acting in a film with Sylvester Stallone, famous for Rambo and other things. Uh, And uh, this is what Sam Neill said. Uh, Sly Stallone and I got on fine, Uh, although he was very preoccupied a lot of the time. I would sit mildly beside him in an uh, unmuscular way while he pumped his considerable muscles all day with a couple of those kind of clamps that grips use around a set. As a result, he was fully pumped, veins are popping all day. There was one exchange I'll never forget. I said, Sly, you get beaten up a lot in this movie. They just beat you up all the time. He said, well, that's a hero, Sam. All these new guys, they walk in a room with 10 bad guys, they beat up all those 10 bad guys. That's not me. I get knocked down. I stand up. I get knocked down. I stand up. I get knocked down, knocked down, knocked down, and finally I stand up. That, says Sylvester Stallone, is a hero. Now, I've never thought of Simon Peter as Sylvester Stallone, but there you go. There's an image for you. But that description is actually a fair description of Simon Peter. Uh, As you track him through the Gospels and then Acts, you see he does get knocked down a lot. Uh, And yet there he is proclaiming this gospel of repentance and faith in Jesus. And so, friends, I want to commend Simon Peter as a model to you. Uh, And in particular, in these three ways. Firstly, He actively recognised who Jesus was and followed him. Literally leaving his old life behind to walk with Jesus. Secondly, it was not always faultless. He relied on the forgiveness in Jesus in the most humiliating time of denial, coming back from that to look after his brothers and sisters in the faith as Jesus commanded. And then thirdly, He shows a passion for repentance and faith in Jesus, in the lives of the people around him. And we get to see that in the book of Acts. Uh, So this Church Father's Day, I'd encourage you to just take a second look at Simon Peter 
And he's a useful model for us as we seek to glorify God in growing in Christ and making him known. Let me lead us in prayer. Our dear Father in heaven, we do thank you for the example of Simon Peter. Uh, please help us to obey and follow your son as he did. Help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour. Uh, help us in our failure to keep returning to the foot of the cross, recognising, accepting your offer of forgiveness. And help us repent of our sins and trust Jesus. Help us to be passionate in proclaiming that message of Jesus that we ourselves cling to. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.